Good morning. Thank you all for being here and being in your seats and uh, ready to start this, uh, this day. I'm Mark Schmidt. I'm the Director of Studies at New America. And uh, we wanted to start the day off with a, uh, a real discussion of you know, the nature of the, of the democratic populace at the, at the moment. And it's getting to kind of the, the underlying questions, not, the, not, not so much the surface questions, but really the dynamics of this populist stage and how we can move it to, to make sure it's a constructive, inclusive, and, and fully pluralist uh, age as well. So to start the conversation, and, and we'll start it here and then expand it, uh, I'm joined by uh, Yasha Monk. Yasha is a, uh, most importantly, a, uh, a fellow in our political reform program, which I, which I launched in 2013. Uh, he's been a New America Fellow. He's an instructor at Harvard. I think he's still a fellow at the German Marshall Fund, or that may have, uh, that's, I think that's a coming, uh, Another couple end. of weeks. Um, but uh, Yasha has been really one of the most acute observers of the kind of uh, threats to democracy, decay of democracy, uh, or decay of liberal democracy, n not just in the US, but, but around the world, and bringing, a, bringing a, a, a global as well as theoretical perspective to it. Uh, and Pete Weiner, Pete is a, a contributor to the, to the New York Times. He's at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and uh, worked in the Bush White House. Uh, uh, on, on mostly on domestic issues, um, uh, uh, and has also been writing about these issues uh, quite a bit. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to start by really asking the question um, uh, of, you know, you know, we can look at we can look at the political divide, the, the American democracy across a number of different dimensions. Um, you know, race and identity is obviously one. Economics is is another. Um, the traditional ideological conflict, big government, small government, which is kind of what we thought we were fighting about for a lot of years. Uh, and then I want to look. I want to make sure we really get to the question of of, of engagement and uh, alienation, and what 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 enables people to connect to a democratic populace and to make decisions together, as opposed to kind of the reaction that I think we saw a lot of, uh, which I, I, I sometimes refer to from, there's a, a, a book by the pollster Stan Greenberg where he broke out the American electorate into a bunch of different types. And my favorite types were what he called the FU boys and the FU old men. <laughs> and I feel like that, that, that sort of reaction has, has played a big, a big role on how do, we, how do we draw that back in. So I'm just going to kind of turn it over to you, and then we'll be joined by some people who are doing a little more work on the ground and direct research, and, and kind of make this a little less abstract. You want to go, Yasha, first? Then? Uh, sure. So, so that, that, that there is a lot. Um, I mean, I think there's a few things to understand when we're sort of trying to grapple with with, with this political moment. Um, the first is that I'm always sort of surprised by how neatly people want to explain what has happened. Um, so, uh, you know, the temptation is to think in binaries, that it has to be either one cause or the other. But what's driving this is, you know, either um, uh, a sort of racial attitudes or it's sort of about economic stress, um, or it's social media, right? Or it was Russia. And, and, and there's this sort of reaction where, like, if somebody says, you know, the, the, the hacking of the Clinton campaign had something to do with it, and there's a bunch of people who are saying, oh, you just want to blame it on the, on, on, on the Russians, and you don't want to admit that there was any problems with the Clinton campaign, right? And, and, and instead, I think we have to think about how any big social political transformation is the result of an interlocking series <coughs> of causes. The world is not monocausal, and that's most obviously true for the tension between sort of economic and, and, and racial causes, right? I think that, that two of the great challenges that we face, not just in the United States, by the way, but also in, in Western Europe and, and many other parts of the world, are, first of all, the slow transformation of a set of countries that had a pretty um, mono-ethnic imaginary of themselves, where in a place like Germany, where I grew up, or, or France, or Italy, uh, those were deeply mono-ethnic, monocultural societies, and they slowly have to learn what it means to be a multi-ethnic society, what it means to have a common identity. And in a place like the States, where obviously you've always had a multi-ethnic society in fact, but you'd also always had a very clear racial hierarchy. And in a similar way, people have to learn what it means to rethink what it is to be an American uh, 
while we are actually pushing against that racial hierarchy and making some progress in overcoming that racial hierarchy, which is something we shouldn't forget. Um, and then on the other side, you have this huge economic transformation where, you know, from 1945 to 1960, the living standard of the average American doubled. From 1960 to 1985, it doubled. Uh, all through American history, it was true that people could look at the material, that most Americans, the large majority of Americans, could look at the material circumstances of the upbringing and say, my God, I have so much more now than when I was growing up. I'm sort of in a transformed world. And since 1985, we haven't seen that improvement in living standards anymore. Um, and people are really angry about that. So what happens when these two things go on at the same time? When on the one side, they are much more afraid of what the economic future holds, when it doesn't seem natural anymore to think, you know what, I'm doing better than my parents were and my kids are gonna do better than me. But they're thinking, you know what, I've worked hard all my life and I'm not doing much better than my parents were and I have good reason to fear that my kids are gonna do worse than me. And then at the same time, you see um, that larger transformation in what America is. I think that's when you get um, a lot of this anger. Um, I was talking to um, a representative who's telling me that, you know, in, in his district, it used to be that you ask people who they are, and they said, you know, I'm a foreman in the factory, or I'm a member of a union, um, or I'm a coal miner, right? And the jobs they have now, it's not necessarily that they're that much poorer, you know? Perhaps they have a job at Walmart that actually allows them to buy as many things as they could have done 30 years ago. But the jobs they now have don't give them the same social identity. They don't allow them to have an earned identity where what they define themselves by is their professional accomplishments. And so what do they default to? Well, they default to a scriptive identity. They now say, well, I'm white and I don't like those people over there, right? And, and so we have to really think about how do we um, do a number of things at the same time. We need to, in the long run, actually improve people's standard of living, make people hopeful for the future, make them feel like they have control over their lives and the state is actually helping them take control over their lives, so that they have a sense that political system is on their side and that they can have a better future. And we need to think very seriously and very carefully, and I know there are some great panels about that today, about what it means, what, what we have in common as Americans. Because I think at the moment we often have obviously a, a very dangerous and disgusting form of white nationalism in, in the White House, frankly, at the <coughs> moment. And then I think um, sometimes a little bit too much emphasis on what divides us um, on other sides of the political spectrum. We really, I think, have to find a new narrative of what we have in common and what kind of common future we want to aspire to. Um, there's also a few things in the short run. We have to beat Donald Trump. Um, but we have to actually reinvigorate the attachment that people have to democratic norms. So some of my academic work, which I'm not gonna go into, shows that there's been a shocking decline in the importance that people give to living in a democracy, and even a shocking increase in the openness to alternatives to democracy, both in the United States and in other countries. And, and I think part of that, frankly, is our fault. I teach at Harvard. Nobody there thinks of their job as transmitting the basic values of our political system and the reason why liberal democracy is better than dictatorship <coughs> or military rule to the next generation of students. Since the beginning of self-governing republics, people have thought carefully about what it means to transmit political values to the next generation. But today, what it means to be an <coughs> academic, what it means in many ways to be a, a journalist, sometimes even a think tank fellow, is to look at the world and say, here's a problem, here's a problem, here's a problem. And there's many things wrong with our world. There's many things wrong with our political system, and we need to have a good analysis of those in order to be able to move towards fixing those. But I think part of our job as people and everybody in this room this is true of, who have a voice, who have a platform, who can write, many of who teach, is to actually explain to people what in the system is worth preserving and building on and how we can reform it and improve it, but also why it's worth having an attachment to the basic <coughs> values of democracy, of the rule of law, 
but now under threat here in the United States and in other countries as well. Wow, that's a great. I love that idea of that as the mission, especially for academia. It would change all the incentives <laughs> for, for tenure and everything else, but that sounds, that sounds great. Pete, do you want to sure, um, take off? Sure. I, I concur with, with everything that Yash said, and he really is. If you're not familiar with his work, you should be. Um, he's, he's really one of the, the great and articulate voices about um, not just what's happening in America, but, but really that's afflicting the Western world. Um, I'll just pick up on a couple of points. I do think that it is important, well, let me start by saying I think this is, this is a perilous moment for the country. I don't want to overstate it. There is a, sometimes a habit for people to think that uh, the problems we face are worse than any other time, uh, and they're not. Uh, this country politically, our political culture is sick, but it's been sicker. We had a civil war, there was the Great Depression, there was World War II. But this is a, a difficult time uh, and, and, uh, and a, a dangerous time, and I think we need to be alert to it. And I think that this, uh, we've got a kind of ugly populism, um, uh, an ethnic nationalism that is um, abroad in the land, uh, not just here, but, but really throughout much of the Western world, uh, a distemper and alienation and an anger. And I do think it's important um, as, as a first step to diagnose it and to understand what, what is driving that. And some of it is malicious and malignant. I wouldn't deny that at all. Anybody who's on the internet could figure that out for themselves, but that isn't I don't think what's the, the, the dominant thing that is going on. And if we begin from that <clears throat> proposition, we're not going to get very, um, very far. I think that there are several things um, that, that are contributing to it. One is this uh, epic um, economic shift that we've seen, uh, globalization, automation, and technology, which is driving uh, Americans apart. And, and we've gone from uh, to a, a high skill uh, economy and low-wage uh, workers and low-skill workers um, are suffering because of it. Um, just one data point: since the um, since the end of the um, Cold War, you've had um, a billion uh, low-wage workers um, enter uh, the, the global marketplace as competition to American workers, mostly because of China and other Asian countries. Now, I think overall that's that's good, but <clears throat> that creates its own own uh, challenges. So we have to understand that. I think that um, there has been a political failure um, that, is, that has happened, that there is a sense that our political system, our political leaders, and our political institutions aren't rising to the moment, um, to the challenges that we face. I think that, that both parties um, uh, are, are responsible for that. Um, and I'll just speak, I'm a lifelong Republican, I'm a conservative, but, but to speak and address my own side, um, there, uh, I had a sense for, for the last several years that Republicans woke up and felt like every day was January 20th, 1981, <laughs> uh, and Ronald Reagan had just been elected, and that the problems were the same and the solutions were the same. And indeed, over the decades um, that uh, the, these supporters in the Republican Party became more Reagan than Reagan, so I'll take one example. Uh, there was a moment in the, in the 2012 debate where they said if you could get $10 in spending cuts for $1 in tax increases, of the 12 people or so who were on the stage, would you entertain that? And no hands went up, because a policy which in general one can defend, which is lower taxes is better, had become a kind of catechism. Um, and um, so this happened, and I actually think that Donald Trump was in, in some respects a, a, a response to that, where sort of categories were, were shattered. But I think both parties, I would say for a lot of Democrats, they wake up and think every day is January 20th, 1965, and the New Deal. So. I do think that, uh, that our political leadership and our political institutions just have not put forward solutions to the problems. I, but I do want to underscore that these are complicated problems. I mean, these people who are in, are in the political class are not stupid. And when you have these epic changes um, uh, and how you deal with globalization, that's not a simple, simple issue. I think we have an unraveling of the social fabric. Um, and I think that we're seeing the dark side of individualism, which is social isolation. And I think that that's um, driving uh, a lot of it. And for some people, a sense of lost uh, cultural change. A lot of people feel like they're being left behind in the modern economy and in the, and the, in the, uh, in the, in the modern um, culture. In terms of what we um, do about it, the first thing I'd say is uh, this is not beyond our capacity to address. These are not forces that we can't uh, deal with, and we're not being attacked from without. A lot of what's going on is within. It's within our capacity. To, 
to, uh, to address it. Um, I'd say one thing that's just required is political leadership. I don't think that's all that's required, but I think it's essential. Um, and, and when I say political leadership, I mean it in two ways. I mean, one is to come up with, with, with a modern um, reform agenda to address um, these problems and challenges that, that are facing people. But I also mean political leadership in the sense of our civic culture. Um, because of this alienation that exists, you can go in two ways if, if, if you're a political leader. You can either try and channel those, those, that anger and that alienation in a constructive way, or you can do the other way. You, you can take advantage of it um, and, and turn up the temperature and throw logs on, on the fire. And we have not had political leaders enough, certainly, uh, who are willing to do um, the former, and far too many that are doing um, the, the latter. That is, the kindling is out there, and we've now got political leaders who are, who are putting ma lighting matches to it. Um, and we have to recognize that, and we have to confront it, and, and ultimately we have to uh, change it. Um, just two other quick things. Um, uh, civic education, I completely agree with Yash on that. Uh, we have to be able to transmit um, a respect um, and reverence even for democratic norms and traditions and a kind of civic comedy. There, there's a lovely line in the, the prelude, uh, a Wordsworth poem, where he says, what we have loved, others will love, and we will teach them how. Uh, and that is, in some respects, one of, the, one of the tasks of education, which is to transmit to others what, what, what we love and revere, and that's not going on. And if that doesn't happen, then you're going to raise a generation of people who don't, don't have respect. And the last thing is, as individual citizens, we, um, we have to engage with other people uh, who don't think like us. And in the abstract, uh, I think most people would agree with it, but when you get down to particular cases, it actually doesn't happen very often. And people need to li learn to listen well to one another. And we just have to, and we can go into this more during Q&A, but people have to bring into their orbit, into their life, uh, people who don't see the world exactly like they do, and they have to be able to listen well. Because one of the problems we have in politics today is, is this extraordinary dehumanization. And when you get to talk to people and get to know them, and if they begin to have a place uh, in your own life, it's just a lot harder to dehumanize them. You may w disagree with them, but you'll at least understand where they're coming from. Uh, and that can be uh, the beginning, hopefully, of coming together rather than apart. Okay, I think this is great. I think we. Uh you both had laid out a, a lot of the issues and we'll continue this in a broader discussion. I was interested, I felt like both of you uh, reached to a language of, of transmitting and the, the idea that, that elites, whether it's political elites or the, you know, the kind of people we are in this room, can play a positive role in kind of uh, bringing values downward, um, I, I want to make sure, we, I, what I want to get into is make sure that we can look at the question of, like, does, is there a possibility for a kind of bottom-up populism that's not ugly populism, you know? A, a populism has two faces in, in, in the American tradition. So we're going to bring out three other people, and I'll introduce them, uh, who have a, either from their research or their other work, uh, have some perspectives on how people are are actually bringing this up. So, other people. <laughs> One day we'll have the, the people will just magically appear, but we're, we're not there. We're not quite there yet. <laughs> Hello, other people. <laughs> All right, I'll introduce the uh, uh, the rest of this group. Actually, although he, although the, these are folks who are all doing. Uh, a lot of significant engagement with, with citizens. They all I th happen to be political scientists, um, <laughs> which is okay. Um, it's, uh, they're they're the, the best kind of political scientists. Um, to my uh, left, Dorian Warren is, uh, is uh, at the Center of Community Change and Center of Community Change Action Fund. He's been a professor at Columbia. He's been a, a, a host on MSNBC and a colleague of mine at the at the Roosevelt Institute. Um, Lydia Bean runs an organization called Faith in Texas. Uh, she's also a Harvard-educated political scientist who's taught at Baylor. Um, and uh, Vanessa Williamson is a fellow at the Brookings Institution and has a wonderful new book called Read My Lips, which is about how Amer how P Americans actually view taxation and paying taxes as a, as a kind of civic good, which I think has been a really revelatory uh, and important book. So you heard some of the conversation. 
here, and I, I'd love for you to, I mean, you can challenge, you can pick fights, that's all encouraged, but <laughs> if you can talk a little bit about how you see some of this kind of education in democratic practice and a sort of healthier kind of populism, if you want to use that term, uh, in your own in your own work. And you're nodding, Lydia, so you can kind of oh. go. <laughs> <laughs> so I come at this problem from the context of Texas, uh, a large, uh, second largest state in the country, uh, a majority minority state. It's a state in which uh, I am the last age cohort in which white people are the largest ethnic group. Uh, and so it's a, a shift, we're, we're economically growing we have a very low unemployment rate. We're an urban, uh, urban state. Um, so f in Texas, the, this issue of, of answering this rancid form of populism, it's impossible to talk about that without also talking about race and ethnicity. Uh, and um, Faith in Texas is part of the, the PICO National Network, which is the largest faith-based organizing network in the country. We're, um, predominantly made up of the largest um, religious communities in Texas, which include black Protestants, Hispanic Catholics, white evangelicals, white mainlanders, and we also have a, a large growing Muslim population in Texas. Um, and what we've found working with John Powell is that really it's impossible to address the, the economic anxiety and pain that people are feeling um, across working class communities, including white working class communities, without also talking about two other dimensions of this anxiety and uncertainty. And um, John Powell talks a lot about the, the belonging, this crisis of belonging, and as well as political powerlessness. So you have, you have belonging, economic anxiety and pain, and political powerlessness. And what made Trump so effective in a value neutral sense is that he addressed all three of those, those forms of anxiety and pain at the same time and blended them together, right? and said, we're gonna make America great again. And what, what has been missing is a really vibrant answer that addresses all three of those axes in an inclusive way. Um, so in, in a Texas context, what we're practically talking about is creating a new people, a new Texas, since we're nationalists and we have our own Texas nationalism, creating and forging a new people that um, really brings together um, African Americans, Hispanics, and working class white people, as well as um, you know, white professionals, right? But but those folks always find their way to the table eventually. So let's just talk about African Americans, Hispanics, and working class whites, which sounds crazy, but it can be done in Texas. It is being done, and so there's no excuses anywhere else in the country, right? If we can organize working class white people in the suburbs of Dallas, Texas, you can do it where you live. And what we've found is that, um, you know, some people think you can just sort of substitute identity politics for economic populism. That's not the case. Practically speaking, what we've found is that uh, you can organize uh, economically struggling white communities, but you have to address this crisis of belonging that white Americans are feeling right now. And I, in some circles, that can be a hard pill to swallow. Uh, you know, it. It doesn't mean coddling fragile white people, you know, the world's tiniest violin playing. It's not, you know, we're not saying that working class white people or white people in general are suffering, they're the true victims. That would be very, very silly indeed. But what we found is that until you name that, that sense of cultural dislocation and crisis of belonging, um, until you offer a really strong, vibrant sense of new community that's forged, that decenters whiteness but includes white people, that includes, that is really um, sort of a new, a new America, if pun, no pun intended, uh, and you offer a really clear vision. Um, until you address that, people, um, people aren't open. But when you do address it, people are open to, to lean into those hard conversations about race, about the economy in a way that they aren't if you don't address that first. Um, a great example of this, um, Faith in Texas has um, been leading a statewide fight to uh, limit payday lending, which is a practice that really targets dis uh, disproportionately blue-collar communities, so folks who have something, a little something to steal, right? Um, and it, it preys on people across race and class lines. And when we started organizing around this issue in um, 
a variety of working class communities, including white communities, um, a lot of working class whites were genuinely surprised that this was a political issue. They just thought it was their own private shame. And so economic pain is also a um, sense of isolation, is also a sense of shame and isolation and political powerlessness. And so what we were offering these communities was not just sort of um, a, an economic agenda, but also a new community. That the idea, join us, join this movement, where your private shame is actually a public problem. There are people who made decisions to steal from blue collar communities, and there are public officials who made a decision to take basically bribes to make this, to change laws, to allow this theft to become legal. And this is a multiracial, multi faith movement that has your back. And that's a very, um, that's a very powerful recipe for organizing in economically struggling white communities. Um, and when you don't address it, it's always wrangling beneath the surface. Because um, Texas is really just an extreme example of what's going on in the, the rest of the country. But there's no way when you, when you have a, a group of people who have been in a majority and who have had the culture, the, the shared identity of Texas defined around them, when you change that, um, what you're going to have is a, a bunch of sad white people uh, you know, next to a Confederate monument being torn down, chanting, we will not be replaced. And as a white person, that's just embarrassing. We can't have that. You have to address that sense of displacement. But when you do address it, we find people are, are willing to lean into the work much more quickly, quickly than you would otherwise expect. Um, one more thing. Um, this is going to be really important in, um, in Texas as we respond to the passage of SB4, which is um, kind of an Arizona law on steroids. Um, and it's, it's going to be nothing short of apocalyptic for Texas, because it basically deputizes every single agent of the state from the local on up as a, an agent of ICE. And um, our response, we can't stop this law from being implemented, right? There's not a policy fix. So our response is collective suffering, basically. That's our, that's our strategy, collective suffering. And so with everything we do within Faith in Texas, our answer to the, the current crisis we find ourselves in is forging a new people. So in our case, it's, it's so that we suffer the consequences of SB4 together. And we're making sure we're, we're involving as many white Anglos, African Americans, and citizen Hispanic um, people in the suffering of our immigrant communities so that together we're forged as a new people. Um, one final thing, um, when you uh, lean into this, this sense of belonging as well as powerlessness and economic pain, um, we're often surprised at how quickly um, people can be transformed. So transformation is possible, uh, but it's a human need to have to feel heard. So just one example, I was leading a training at a African American mega church in the suburbs of Dallas, Texas, and we were joined by a a young white Republican operative who was, you know, friendly guy, really nice, scouting us out for a local um, Republican candidate. He just wanted to figure out what, what we were about and make a pitch for his candidate at the end, um, which he didn't get to do. And <laughs> in passing, you know, I, it was a mostly black audience. I kind of felt bad for this one white guy sticking out. And so I, um, I just mentioned in passing that um, one of the things we have to address as a state is the sense of dislocation that white people are feeling. Uh, and how a lot of white middle class parents are afraid to send their kids to the public schools because their kids will be in a minority. And they don't know how to do that. They don't have the cultural tools about how to send your kid to school and to be you know, one of a, a few white kids in their class. And, and this guy basically almost jumped out of his seat. He was like, yes, yes, that's what we're feeling. That's it, that's it. And um, you know, the, the black leaders were kind of looking at him like, what, <laughs> really? And one older gentleman says, welcome to my world, buddy. Welcome to my world. Really, this is new to you? You're freaking out about this? But we were able to have a real conversation about that. And once, once you're able to name that, the, the problem that has no name, that Trump has now given a name, people are suddenly very open to what you have to say next. Um, so it's, you know, sometimes in the, after the Trump election, there's this fear in the world of, my world of grassroots organizing that if we're talking about white pain, that's gonna come at the cost of silencing people of color. <clears throat>
But what we found is that it's actually possible to do both very well at the same time and to build a movement that has a white working class base, a white middle class base, but also um, in our organization, it's predominantly black and Hispanic millennials. And you can lean into topics like police violence, like immigration, if you're willing to also take um, the, the crisis of belonging seriously in white communities. Great, that's fascinating, Lydia, thank you. Um, it's good, it's a good sign that there is outreach actually to a black community, you know, I mean, that's I think a very hopeful uh, promise because if you just have a politics that's our, our group and the other group without any attempt at that kind of outreach, we're, we're stuck. Um, uh, Dorian, I think uh, Lydia covered a bunch of issues. I wanna make sure we have time for Q&A, but you work with a lot of groups that are organizing around immigration as well. And what's, what's your perspective um, as a scholar and as a doer on how we bring those, the kind of connections that Lydia's talking about or that Yasha and Pete were talking about? Uh, thanks for the easy question, Mark. <laughs> mm. I really appreciate that. Um, it's a really difficult issue, especially if you see the Washington Post this morning. Um, there's an article about the increased number of deportations under this administration, um, which is literally tearing families apart and communities apart, um, and in some ways erasing the history of this country in terms of this nation being partly an immigrant nation. Um, so it's, it's hard because we, we hear stories every single day of people in fear of agents trailing kids from schools mm -hmm. to get to their parents um, because they suspect that they're undocumented, right? So, that's, so there's one question around how do you, and I think the big theme here is how do we link people's fates together? so that they do see themselves as belonging to the same community or nation. And so how do we link the fates of immigrant families and people with non-immigrants, right, with native-born citizens? And it's a challenge, and we've seen some signs of hope. If you saw, if you remember um, after the executive order with the Muslim ban, the protests at the airports, those are mostly American citizens who were showing up to say, no, this is, we're gonna create a circle of protection around our immigrant and Muslim brothers and sisters. So there are lots of signs of hope. Um, I wanted to pivot to, some, to a few things Lydia said on this theme, actually, that the both of you talked about as well. And it is this theme around how do we create linked fate among people that, um, whether they have a different ascriptive identities, Yasha, as you described it, or just don't see each other as part of the same community. So I just got back from Cleveland, Ohio, where I took some um, very rich friends of mine from San Francisco and New York <laughs> to get outside the blue bubble and to actually meet some people that are not like them. <laughs> so we went to Warren, Ohio, in Trumbull County. That county voted twice for Obama and then flipped to Trump. It hadn't voted Republicans since 1928. And we made them, um, I and my friends made them, made the folks I took, we made them door knock to actually talk to people, which was scary for folks. And it was fascinating because you got, um, and we did the same in East Cleveland, which is predominantly black community. Warren is much more working class, poor white, but they're, it's somewhat integrated. And the stories we heard from the people in East Cleveland and the people in Warren are very, very similar. Um, Deindustrialization wasn't like an abstract concept, it was a lived experience. And it was a very, very common theme of how when jobs literally left, the fabric of the community fell apart. Two things on this and then I'll shut up. One of the things I learned is, um, and this creates the opportunity for linking fates. So everybody on the doors talked about heroin and opioid. And it's fascinating, because I grew up in the 80s, so I remember what happened when jobs left my community and black people were unemployed and turned to drugs as a way to soothe the harm, and we locked those folks up. And we're much more tender and caring now, and I'm all appreciative of that. But it is fascinating, because one of the things they said, and I learned in Ohio, is one of the highest rates of incarceration are white rural women because of the drug epidemic. So how do we think about creating some linked fates between the folks in East Cleveland who have been 
subject to the war on drugs, which apparently the Attorney General has restarted, for decades with folks that have experiencing the same kind of harm and pain a few decades later and are being caught in the criminal justice system, right? So how do we create those bonds of linked fate to try to transform and change it? So that's the first thing. And then second, I do think we need to figure out what is the new economic vision for the future and, lit and how are we gonna create economic security for people when there is just sheer hopelessness? And the, because one of, you know, I was curious, so why did this, twice people voted for Obama and then split the Trump? And actually it wasn't a national story about Clinton or anything else. It was actually a reminder that all politics is local. Because for decades, their local Democratic politicians have been telling them that they're going to make things better, and things have only gotten worse. So you, you do that for 30 years, you live like that for 30 years, and then you get this guy who resonates emotionally, and he's, he's speaking your pain. Of course they flip to Trump. But it's actually not that hard to figure out why. <laughs> because the Democratic local politicians have been promising things for decades and decades and decades, and not being honest about saying, maybe I have no agency about the factory that left. Maybe I can't bring that back. Maybe I got, we got to figure out something else. So it was just a reminder that in some ways all politics is also very local as we're having a national level of conversation about political transformation and this administration and what could be next in 2018 or 2020. If we're not building and developing people at the local level to solve their own problems and to run for office and to build leadership then well, I say it this way, I'll say it this way. The route to national power and transformation is through local places and states. And unless we refocus on those local problems, what happens at the national level, we're gonna always be stuck. That's fascinating, thank you, Dorian. I think it's, uh, it's interesting to think that people would, you know, instead of realizing, okay, maybe politicians don't have this agency over the economy, they would turn to somebody who's actually promising a different level of agency at a, at a totally different, um, in a totally different zone. Um, Vanessa, I, I feel like you have all, you've kind of uncovered some undercurrents of civic capacity yeah. in, in your work, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how you see uh, that capacity and how to, how to draw it out in service of a yeah, so more I think positive populism. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and, I'll try and uh, put, add the positive note a little bit. So I think that, um, <laughs> My, before I wrote my most recent book, my previous book was on the Tea Party. So I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about uh, older white conservatives primarily who were very involved in the early years of the Obama administration opposing uh, the agenda uh, coming from the Obama administration opposing the person of Barack Obama. Uh, and you know, frankly, uh, motivated by things that are very much things that motivated Trump supporters, a lot of concern about immigration and about cultural change. Um, and then I kind of took my, I, I felt like I took my eye off the ball, right? Because I, I did this work on the Tea Party and then went on and did some other things. And then it seemed like the, the, the aspects of the Tea Party that were so interesting, uh, you know, first of all, the motivations of, uh, of white people who were very conservative, but at the same time, the sort of media world in which they lived, right? It was a very unique media world and very much a media world that Donald Trump was good at, at uh, operating in. Um, and so I, I went to do this other work, and the work I did was actually driven by an experience I had at a Tea Party uh, event, where I noticed that these people who were very angry about what they thought government was doing, very, very angry, very angry about ACA, very angry about the sort of idea that they had lost control of their government, um, nonetheless described themselves as taxpayers. And that seemed funny to me, right? Because at the end of the day, you're mandated to pay taxes. And it, how could that be something you're proud of even when you're so very unhappy with where you think the money's going? And so I, I looked into this in more detail. And one of the, a really interesting sort of thread in American history, uh, both on the left and the right, is to talk about, uh, is for citizens and non-citizens to describe themselves as taxpayers as evidence of contributing to their community and as evidence that they have a right to be represented by their government. Right? And so uh, this can be a, a very ex exclusive language, right? And I think you see this sometimes uh, on the Tea Party side of things that, you know, I'm a taxpayer and someone out there is not. Someone else is not paying taxes, which requires you to ignore sales taxes, payroll taxes, property, all the kinds of taxes that low-income people actually pay a lot of. 
Um, but it can also be a very inclusive language, and you see this sort of more on the left over, over the course of our history. I mean, you know, from the founding, of course, the idea that if I am taxed, I deserve representation. Well, that would, same language was adopted uh, by the women's rights movement. Uh, it was adopted by the civil rights movement, and it has recently been uh, adopted by undocumented immigrant groups, talking about the fact that they're, they're chipping in their share, right? So they contribute to this country, too. They want to be part of America. And so I think that, uh, you know, and what shocked me was the strength of this sentiment uh, across the political spectrum, I mean, something like 95% of Americans see tax paying as a civic duty, uh, and they feel that quite strongly. Um, and what shocked me about this was how that civic sentiment had survived what must be, what, four decades now of really profound anti-tax rhetoric, right? So it's interesting to me, and, you know, and Trump is in some ways an exception at the, at the very end of this time period uh, where he actually, it, it is common for Republicans to oppose, to oppose high taxes, right, to say taxes should be lower. It is not common for them to say they don't pay taxes, right? So we're really at an unusual moment where there has been a profoundly strong civic tradition of tax paying uh, and a, a, a sort of use of this symbolism as evidence that one is a contributing American, one's doing one's part, right? And then now, it's very interesting to see whether we're at the moment where that, like other civic norms, might break. Mm -hmm. But I, the fact that it has survived so long, I think, is actually a sign of hope. Mm -hmm. That's good. I know we want to really open it up to Q&A. If, if anybody, he, if anything you, anybody heard that you want to challenge, question, ask a question about? Otherwise, we'll go to Q&A. All right, let's, let's open it up. Please wait for somebody to bring, raise your hand if you want to ask a question and uh, wait for somebody to bring the microphone to you and uh, say who you are. Nobody wants to be the first question of an America conference. Yes, over in the, like by, by that exit sign over there. Is somebody taking the microphone? Hello, over there. Thank you, and just say who you are, please. Hi, my name is Benjamin Lee from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and my question is about the urban-rural divide within the United States. Okay. How do you think that has shaped the political culture and the civic culture within the U.S., and are there any possible solutions to address this problem? Thank you. Or maybe any, I mean, anybody, all of you can start with that, but maybe you may deal with it more often, Lydia, more directly. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a common misconception that Texas is a rural state. About 75% of Texans live in just um, basically three urban areas. So you can, you know, talk to vast majority of Texans without, you know, driving off into the boonies. Um, but I, I think the, the urban-rural divide is huge, and there are solutions. Uh, but first I want to say it's not really an urban-rural divide. It's um, like five cities where Democrats sort of hold themselves up and then the rest of America, right? So that's, it's a different problem if you're like, we have the cities, our people have the cities, and you people can have like the little town. That's a very condescending and somewhat delusional view of viewing the problem. To be quite honest, uh, when you lose the suburbs, which many of which are cities in their own right of you know 400,000 people, you have a problem, right? It wouldn't yeah, even. Well, let's not do it so yeah. much in partisan terms as in kind of yeah. culture and engagement. Yeah, and yeah, the, you the have kind a problem. Of bigger so, issues that we've been talking. Um, so I will say that um, they are possible to solve. I think if you're talking specifically about rural, I was talking with Dee Davis. Um, and one of the things that's really clear if you, if you spend time in cities under, say, 25,000, is that there's a, a complete collapse of civic infrastructure. And a lot of what's left behind is um, Christian radio and talk radio. Right, low tech. You don't need civic tech. It's uh, very low tech and extremely polarized. And um, these are spaces where there's not contestation. There's not dialogue. Uh, and if you have a sort of civic infrastructure that's basically just in five very big cities, right? And um, again, this is not just a partisan problem. This is a, you know, civic infrastructure. If you're part of a sort of civic community that wants to engage most Americans, but you're just in five major metropolitan areas, um, you're having a problem with suburbs as well, but you're also not reaching these very small towns. And one of the things that happened, and Dorian, you, you really alluded to this earlier, is this slow atrophy 
of you know, small town papers. Uh, and then, you know, democratic institutions, the, the precinct chairs who remember the New Deal mm -hmm. uh, are starting to die. Well, they're, they're basically a, a whole generation are, you know, just gone. There's no one to replace them. Um, they're, um, many of the churches are in a full state of collapse. People forget that the most rapidly secularizing popula population in, in America today is um, working class and rural white people. Um, not because they're deciding they, they want to be atheists, but because churches are unraveling as institutions outside of um, wealthy areas. And that is a very dangerous place. And that was happening long before Trump came. And, and no one can say that we couldn't have seen it coming, because you totally could have seen it coming, because you know we've been telling you for 15 years, you could have seen it coming. So I think fixing that is about, it's not just about who you're talking to, but also where you're talking, right? So it's, it's about um, being outside of these major five cities and um, having presence and speaking to that audience and recognize they're an audience that uh, a lot of folks haven't talked to in a very, very long time. Yeah, there is, I think, you know, if you look at some of the things that Jim Fallows has mm -hmm. written uh, about, you know, communities like Erie, Pennsylvania, or whatever, there are, there are other than those five cities, there are a lot of mm -hmm. smaller cities and communities where there is a, a little bit more civic capacity. Yasha, you want to? Yeah, so as we have so many political scientists here on the, on the stage, so I think all of us will agree that, like, the way to try and understand the phenomenon is sort of comparative, right? Like, you have to look at other countries as well, because if you just look at the United States, you might think, that a story that seems really prominent here explains the rise of populism, when in other countries where that story isn't happening, you still have the same outcome. And so I struggle with that, mm -hmm. because I'm trying to, I, I just finished a draft of a book that, that does try to explain the rise of populism, not just in the States, but in other countries as well. But, but most of the factors that seem to be present in nearly every country, there's a good counterexample to. So we very complacently in the United States want to think, you know, Trump, that's a problem of old people. Right, like only old people voted for Trump mm -hmm. and young people didn't. And like, A, that's not true. Young people in the United States, white young people in the United States voted for Trump 48% to 43%. The most shocking fact about the 2016 election. I just put exclamation point on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> exclamation point. But also, it's not true in other countries. So you look at France, and actually 20% of people 65 or older voted for Marine Le Pen in the second round of a presidential election. 44% of people below the age of 25 did. So it's not true that only young people vote mm -hmm. for it, right? Uh, one explanation well, the Brexit I Brexit was much, in, was yeah, so much it's a, further in. Right, so right. Brexit and Trump, where it was true that old people mostly voted for it, but France, Poland, India, it's not true that young people don't vote for the populists, right? So it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Stagnation of living standards, I think that's a really big cause, right? I always talk about it. But look, you look at Poland, the GDP increased sixfold between 1990 mm -hmm. and now. And they have a huge problem with that. So there's a counterexample there, right? You look at um, um, the difficulties of transitioning a mono-ethnic society into an equal multi-ethnic one, right? Well, you look at Eastern Europe, we have a populist problem in huge spades, and there's very, very few immigrants. So mm -hmm. there's a different form of it. They have demographic fears about it. They see what's happening in Western Europe. They don't like it. But it's not straightforward. The one story that's actually straightforward everywhere, and this is how it relates to the question, is the urban-rural divide. I have not seen a single electoral map in the United States, in Britain, in France, in Poland, in Turkey, in India, in Russia, where it's not the case that a lot of this populist anger comes from more rural or ex-urban areas, and where the sort of more liberal democratic candidates do much better in the cities. So there's something really universal going on here, and it makes me a little skeptical about how much we can do about it, actually. I think it really is driven by some very deep technological <laughs> drivers that are difficult to confront. But, but yes, the urban-rural question, I think, is crucial, and it's the one thing that really is universal so far as I can. There's also, I mean, there's, for the entire scope of American history, <coughs> rural has been overrepresented, you know, as a, from one way or another. I mean, one person, one vote, which was kind of a miraculous uh, ruling. Uh, uh, it was a, began to break that, but didn't really uh, do that at all. There's a sign that says stop. So, uh, you know, <laughs> anybody have any, I don't think we'll do another question. Anybody have any last comment? Because I, I'm going to slightly ignore the sign. Ah. Screw up the whole. Uh, <laughs> yeah, any last uh, thoughts? Because it kind of came up suddenly. That, <laughs>
Oh, I know. I just think that this point about uh, the rural-urban divide is, is critically important. But one aspect of it over which we might have some control is what visions of one another we receive. Right? Because one of the big challenges, I think, is that the image of the cities in rural America and the image of rural America in the cities is a nasty stereotype. Right? That's what we're seeing a lot of the time. And a lot of that comes from the fact that, you know, when you were talking about corporate, or, you know, like talk radio and you know, these sorts of, the, the, the vision you get of people you don't see is so uh, toxic in this country right now. And I think that that's probably something that crosses national boundaries. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I, uh, I think you know, much of what has driven this is, is, is economic. Uh, I think a, a lot of the data supports that, and we, we talk some about it. But what's happened is this sort of economic divide has is, is, is transmuted into this tremendous cultural um, divide. And I think a lot of this election, a lot of what's happening today, is, um, is this kind of cultural alienation um, from, from each other. And apropos what uh, Vanessa was saying, I spoke uh, with Arlie Hochschild, who's a uh, sociologist in, uh, at, at Berkeley, and she wrote a, a lovely book called Strangers uh, in Our Own Land, and she went actually to, to uh, Louisiana, the bio country, to understand the Tea Party. She's a liberal. And she came to uh, really like the people there. Um, they were very kind to her, and she was struck by that. Um, but she said that what, what was driving so much of what they felt uh, was a sense of dishonor and humiliation. Um, and when people feel humiliated, th that leads to anger, uh, and anger leads to bad things uh, in a, in a, in a self-governing country. And I, I can't underscore enough how important, and some of the people spoke eloquently about it, it is that people feel heard. Um, they, they have to feel like you don't, um, and this goes on both sides, that you don't look at them uh, as subhuman uh, or, or driven um, by, by maliciousness. And that's just not going on right now. We have these, to the extent that I, I've never experienced in my life, and it probably is rare in, in American history because of technology and all of the rest, is we're living in political silos, we're, we're living in cultural silos, we're living in theological silos. And as long as that continues um, to happen, uh, this kind of fierce anger um, and alienation is going to be with us. And there's not a magic uh, want that's going to solve this, and, and it's not going to be a leader coming in. Uh, we are a self-governing country, and in the end, um, this is done a person at a time and a community at a time, and some of the people here are doing something about it, um, but that has to happen, um, and uh, it's, we don't have any time to go into how that can, but I, but I really do believe this notion of, of hearing and, and even a friendship, which is not, friendship not just people who see the world the same way, but see wor the world in a different way and appreciate each other for that because it helps um, widen the aperture. So none of us has a perfect angle on the truth. And the whole idea of democracy is that there is such a thing as a collective wisdom, that we're a fallen people, that none of us has, um, can fully ascertain uh, the truth and the reality of things. And we, we have to model, uh, including political leaders, this idea that we have something to teach each other. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. I think we're literally going to get the hook. Do you want to, you had something? Just really uh, quickly, I think one thing besides comparative analysis, it's also helpful to do historical analysis. Mm -hmm. So I've been rereading, Sibyl will know this, I've been rereading um, the great book by W.B. Du Bois, Black Reconstruction in America. Mm -hmm written in 1935, which is about the same distance from the Civil War that Anne-Marie Slaughter mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. that we are now from the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s. So it was very freshly written. And so there's some lessons there about what happens when your community and economy is destroyed, and what are some experiments to rebuild those political bonds, and what happens when they fall apart, especially around race. So there's some lessons, historically as well as comparatively, that we might learn about how to rebuild our democracy. Okay, good. Reading, reading assignments are good. Okay, well hopefully the rest of the day we'll build on some <laughs> of the questions raised by this panel, and I would please give everybody here a big uh, round of applause.